All right. Uh, welcome to an event I'm super excited about, a uh, legislative kickoff for the, 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 the current le legislative session. This will be going through the beginning of April. I'm sure that Joe and Chris can tell you exact dates for Sine Die. Uh, I always have trouble finding that. Uh, quick intros. Uh, I'm Ben uh, with Zolna. I'm the co-chair of the Coat Committee, uh, who's who's putting this program on. Um, and then our real collaborators today, the people doing most of the presentation, uh, are Chris Parts. And I'm going to read his bio. Chris Parts' professional experience has been focused on the planning and design of interiors, institutional, and educational facilities. His long-standing relationships with many clients reflect his understanding of client needs and his ability to create a uh, stimulating environment. His straightforward project management style combined with his keen listening skills and creative vision deliver a seasoned balance of high-end design and functionality. And then Joe and Joe Metashevsky, also known as American Joe, I think that may actually be your legal name from this bio. It's correct. Uh, has been a delegate, a state senator, a candidate for governor, and a lobbyist for the private sector for the last 23 years. Um, he is also he is also a private business owner, um, and uh, is also a speaker, seminar leader, and trainer on state government lobbying to national and local clients. A graduate of University of Baltimore, and uh, the lobbyist for AIA Maryland. So. Meet your lobbyist, everybody from AIA. Mm -hmm. Good morning. Um, I'd say take it away. Uh, and again, I'm really looking forward to this. Okay. Well, Ben, thank you very much for that. I appreciate it. It's it's, it's good to be here and to uh, to share a bit about what what a lobbyist does and what a client uh, that is uh, astute enough to retain a lobbyist, particularly to either in, enhance their profession or protect it uh, from the various legislation that's usually always introduced you know, in each legislative session. Let me just start off by saying politics is a, is a collaborative effort. It, it's, it's the community, the representatives, it, it's, a, it's a full contact sport as well, if you want to survive. And the decisions aren't made in a vacuum down there. We, there are 188 legislators that convene, and they're convening right now until April 11th, when they will, will, will adjourn. And during that time, they'll, they'll consider a couple thousand pieces of legislation. And the, uh, the way they're able to do that is it's broken up into committees. I won't get into the very basics of this, but they are all... Uh, uh, the bills are assigned to committees where there is a, a level of expertise, if you will, among the legislators to, to, to address those issues. But I, I have to say, as we were talking just before we started, that government, you know, I've, I've been doing this a long time. It's, it's, it's really come a long way. When, when, I, when I first started in my, my legislative days, my district was a heavily blue collar district. Uh, Barbara Mikulski and I were neighbors. She was my councilwoman and my, my, uh, my member of Congress. I was her delegate and her senator. And we, we spoke to each other a lot and saw each other a lot. And one of her favorite uh, sayings was, is that our district at the time was a high touch district rather than a high tech district. And I'm going way, way back because, you know, if, if people, uh, had a problem with a, a tree limb in front of their doorway in the house that may have come down during a storm or a water main break or something, they, they automatically picked up the phone and they called their, their representative, their, their elected official to do that. And, and government's really, really come a long way. It's, it's more responsive to today's needs. Uh, you know, the, the services that have improved and the, I have to say, I mean, just when you think of all the apps that are available, you know, whether it's the MVA or voter registration, property tax payments, jury duty, you know, all of those things elected officials used to do. So now that that's kind of been taking off of most of the legislators and elected officials' shoulders, there's more time to collaborate with, with constituents and their issues. And that, that's a really good thing. And it's changed at the local level. One of the things that people fail to realize that, that don't get involved in the political arena 
is that every day that the legislature is in session or even when they are planning their legislative agenda, it affects your profession. You know, it, it, they try to protect the public, but sometimes in protecting the public, they're, they're well-intentioned, but they overstep uh, some basic tenets that drive whether you're an architect or an engineer or whatever your profession might be. But there are always, and this is what Chris and I and the other board members of the AIA look for is opportunities for your business, inclusion for minorities, qualifications for your, your profession, and to keep it at a level that protects the public. The health, safety, and welfare is foremost in our minds in any kind of legislation that we might, we might uh, either support or oppose. So just to talk about you know, my bona fides, I, I was elected when I was 24 years old and I served in the house. Um, I actually, um, at the time, I was elected chair of the Baltimore city delegation when the city delegation had become a, my, a majority minority uh, uh, delegation. And I was very proud of that. Um, I spent, then I, I went to the Senate and I served in the Senate. And um, after 20 years in the legislature, I thought that uh, I might move on and, and do something else. And um, I, I said to my wife, I'm either moving up or moving out, one or the other. And it was, I never planned on doing this, but I just decided I'm gonna take a shot and run for governor. I got into the race late, but uh, I ran second to Paris Glenn Denning in the, in the Democratic primary. And it gave me a chance to see Maryland in a, in a not a kaleidoscopic, but a panoramic view, if you will. Uh, spent 10 months going around to big cities, little towns, things like that, and got a real sense for um, what made Maryland tick. So after, uh, after the campaign, I was just gonna walk away and just not uh, not get involved in, in politics. And I was approached by a couple of lobbyists that uh, lobbied me over the years and asked if I would consider coming with, with their law firm and being part of the lobbying practice. And I had said no, and they, they talked me into coming in and talked to the chair. And so we had a couple of sit downs and a lunch and he said, why don't you just give it a try? And that was a couple of decades ago. And, um, it's been a very interesting, a very rewarding uh, career. And it, it's just um, amazing when I, I'm, I'm happy to talk to people anytime about what I do and what the legislators do. And I, they, I find it fascinating every time I talk about it. And I, I know that some people have sh not shared with me that the, the comment, I didn't know they did that. I didn't know that's how it worked. I didn't know that's how it happened. So right now, yesterday was the bill filing deadline in the legislature. I mean, they just started. Now they had time to pre-file legislation, which they did. And yesterday was the deadline for, for filing, uh, you know, filing your bills. In other words, giving the, the, the information to the uh, Department of Legislative Reference to get everything in, in, in order so that when the bill is dropped and, and read for the first time, people can read it and make, make some sense of it. But the, you know, it's just amazing how even after doing this all this time, you see people, you see the, 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 you see the system work, it works. And, and there's 188 people that have all these ideas. And uh, Chris can tell you, we sit down once a week, every Monday. I mean, we, we I think our, we've only had two meetings so far, the first week before the session started and then this past Monday, we have over 50 bills already that we have expressed an interest in that we'll either monitor or we'll either write a letter of a support or offer an amendment or opposition or appear in person. Well, now because of COVID, it's all done by Zoom, but um, we'll, we'll take a position. And um, I wanna hats off to, to Chris. Um, he's been a mentor to me about the, the profession of architecture over the years for which I'm truly grateful, but it's, it's a slog. It really is. It's a, it's an uphill battle all the time. And I'll just digress for a minute to tell you about a couple of 
issues that, that people find amazing. When I was in the legislature, a senator from Montgomery County uh, continually put a bill in, and I say continually because it took 17 years for this bill to pass. It was called the, the covered truck bill. And it was to put the tarpaulin over the tractor trailers that had an open trailer at, that debris would either blow off of or fall off of and hit the road and then a stone would bounce up and crack your windshield. And so um, the trucking industry had a very, very talented lobbyist. And of course, that lobbyist, um, I think it was when he finally retired that the bill passed and uh, there was a rookie lobbyist that came in, if I'm remembering that correctly, but it took 17 years uh, to get that bill passed, which is a, is a common sense, logical type of bill. Um, the ophthalmologist and the optometrist fought for 21 years. The optometrist wanted to get diagnostic eye drops so that when you went for a visit, they could use these eye drops for whatever their uh, particular situation was. But the two, the same two lobbyists, the, the lobbyist for the uh, op ophthalmologist and the lobbyist for the optometrist, they fought tooth and nail for 21 years. And finally, diagnostic drops for optometrists were approved. Um, I myself had uh, an example um, I was asked, I was uh, in my second or third year in the House, and the state's attorney of Baltimore asked if I could put a bill in to do away with a bill. It was an archaic bill, a uh, law that was called a year and a day law. The year and a day law said that, here's an example, if you hit somebody over the head with a hammer and they were taken to the hospital and they were in a coma, if they lived for a year and a day, you, you, that was not considered murder. So put the bill in, um, the chief prosecutor from the state's attorney's office came, the lieutenant from the homicide division came and we had a coroner come. It was like one of these TV shows where the coroner comes in and gives all the uh, information. And so we walked into the judici judiciary committee and there were cameras there, but it wasn't for my bill. There was a bill, bef there was a bill after us and the TV cameras were all there. And we came up before that, that other bill, and the testimony was just riveting. The um, lieutenant from the homicide division gave all of these incredible uh, examples. Uh, the the, the, uh, uh, the uh, state's attorney, the assistant state's attorney who was there, he gave instances and in trials where he had to argue against this law, and then the coroner. Uh, and it was just, it was just amazing. And when we started to talk, the cameras that were there for the bill after us started to roll. And I thought, wow, this is, this is really something. We've got, we're gonna have coverage tonight on the six o'clock news and whatever. And so about two or three days later, and generally it takes a while for them to consider these bills. Two or three days later, I'm on the house floor and I'm looking at the report that comes out from all the committees. And a mentor of mine from South Baltimore, he walked up he was another legislator and he said, you look like you just lost your best friend. And I said, Paul, I had this bill in for the year and a day and I told him what it was. And, and I, I said, it, they killed it. it. It's dead, it didn't pass. And I told him we had this like big production, the cameras were on and everything. I, I'm thinking, how could I not have that bill passed? And he said, Joe, when you go back to your office, look at who's on that committee. And back then there were more attorneys than you could ever think of. And he said, particularly defense attorneys. He said, go back there. He said, it's never about you. Don't worry about it. Don't ever think this is about you. It's about people's interests on those committees. So I went, went back, found out that so many of these uh, members of the committee were, were, were attorneys in their own right. And they were, you know, they're casting their vote as they can. And it was a real lesson to me, it really was. So it was, it was kind of tough to, to swallow, but we, we realized that as long as that kind of profile of that committee was there, we're not gonna get that bill passed. 25 years later, I'm having breakfast and I picked the Baltimore Sun up and I see that the year and a day rule passed. <laughs> and it was, I had left the legislature. I thought everybody had forgotten about that, but they finally, finally passed that bill. So. You know, it's, it, it takes patience. It takes a great amount of skill. 
and it takes it, it just takes a lot of things happening. One more story, if you don't okay. mind. I um, and actually, yeah. Joe, I'm sorry. I yeah, think, we gotta we gotta start I talking about Bill. <laughs> roll on to Bill's here, if that's all sure. right. All right, I'll let yeah, I'll let uh, Chris do it. Yeah, I forgot an important part of Chris's bio. Chris runs the committee that's a joint committee between AA, Maryland, and Baltimore, and occasionally has USGBC Maryland or USGBC national members also sitting on it. Uh, so Chris is up in the middle of the legislative push every year. I don't envy his or Joe's January. <laughs> right. um, Thanks, Ben. And, and, and I think that, you know, what, what I found in, I, you know, I don't know how many years I've been involved in this, but I, I felt like I was very uh, overwhelmed when I first started not really understanding things. And I think as, you know, I've been more involved in, and engaged and had the opportunity to, to meet legislators and, and testify. Um, I think to, to Joe's point, what I've learned is that the collaboration across um, uh, individuals and institutions is really important and trying to find ways to, to broaden our net. Um, so I think that's one of the, you know, one of the really important lessons that we've learned. And I think it's something that we're getting better at. Um, I'm going to just share my screen for a minute on a couple of things that um, I think in case you're able to, uh, to see, just wanted to make sure that if you haven't contacted uh, your legislators in the past, um, this MarylandElect.net um, is a great way for you to identify who your elected officials are. And I think that those are clickable links for you to get directly to your elected officials. Uh, so if you wanna communicate with them, that's a great way to be able to do that. Um, then uh, just in terms of the, um, the groups that we most often communicate with um, uh, on the House of Representatives, the, the committees that typically hear bills that we work with, I think are economic matters, environment and transportation, and health and government operations. Um, I just, in parentheses, I put who my delegates are here um, and, and Senator, and then also in the Senate, it's typically budget and tax and uh, the EHEA, education, health and environmental affairs. Um, and as, as I've been learning more and more on this, I also have uh, just in the past two years had an inside scoop now um, where my state delegate, um, Kathy Forbes, uh, as a long-term friend of mine and my wife now works as a legislative aide for her. So I get to, to hear things from, uh, from the inside and get uh, you know, some, some useful information. Um, never really anticipated. My wife actually is uh, educated and trained and worked most of her career as an interior designer, um, but uh, I took this opportunity to work with Kathy and I think it's just been uh, great, uh, you know, great for, uh, for both of them. Um, and I've certainly learned a lot as well. <laughs> um, then, um, then essentially, uh, I think as Joe was mentioning, you know, each of the committees kind of has uh, issues that they specifically deal with. So typically, let's say for the House of Representatives, economic matters, you know, deals with economic development, business regulation, consumer protection, environment protection or transportation deals with issues that are important to us as does health and government operations. Um, and similarly with the Senate committees, budget and tax and education, health and environmental affairs are issues that we deal with. Um, I did grab just the overall session uh, dates here. So, uh, so Ben, I found Sine Die. <laughs> it's April 11th. Um, uh, so essentially, that there are dates of, of kind of thresholds of information that um, you know that need to uh, to be introduced um, uh, in order for things to to proceed. I think was it last year or year before the session was cut short three weeks or something like that. Right. So, so it made for a very short, uh, a, a very abrupt end to session and, and things were a little challenging in the way that that worked. Um, yeah, the, the 2020 session got cut short and a whole bunch of bills just didn't right. quite get done right. and, and flowed into 2021. Right. Um, 
and you know for for those you know contacting your legislator you know when you look on that maryland general assembly you can find them you can get information about them find out how to contact them um and um and find um any information about them where you you might uh, you know be able to establish a bit of a rapport from some similar experience or knowledge there so i think that's something very very useful to know um and then additionally you know as you're taking a look on the on the website basically you can look up information you know by by bill number you can also study you know look at by keyword if you're planning to connect with um, uh, legislators and submit testimony, you have to use this little My MGA button to set up an MGA account in order to be able to communicate and submit written or uh, identify for oral testimony. And then if you're looking up a specific bill, um, you know, just a couple of things that I think are probably useful you know, looking for the sponsor and co-sponsor so that you'll know, you know, who's behind the bill. Typically there's a synopsis um, and, you know, during the process of the bill, you'll have a current text that I think is under the history tab uh, that you'll be able to see like a first or second or third reading. Um, and it, you know, that may change through the process if it's amended particularly if you're planning on submitting uh, either written or oral testimony, um, uh, the fiscal and policy note is really important to understand, you know, um, you know, most of our legislators are focused on, is this going to cost the state money, how much um, and why? Um, so making sure that you understand that and then kind of seeing what some of those amendments might be. Um, and, and then Briefly, um, uh, we- oh, Chris, do you want to talk about the timeline of when you must submit testimony or sign up? It's, it's oh, a little yes. archaic. Yes, yeah. So I think it's, um, and, and help, help me out, I think it's two days before uh, the testimony uh, or before the hear bill hearing. And it's between, and because this is all submitted online, it's between 10 a.m. and 3 p.m. Uh, that you have to submit. Um, and so and, if they have a hearing next Monday, you, you need to know that Thursday previous. It's, right. You know, it's See. business days, not calendar days. Yeah, so you have to kind of plan and plan in advance to uh, <laughs> to to be able to do that and get your testimony you know, prepared. Um, so as Joe had mentioned, you know, we we have uh, basically a meeting every Monday to kind of track our uh, the bills that we're uh, looking at. And Sandy, I think, posts a current version of that on the uh, uh, AIA Maryland web uh, so that you can kind of see what, uh, you know, what are uh, issues that we're focused on, what we've submitted on, what we're testifying on. Um, and if you're interested, uh, we certainly welcome, uh, welcome input and welcome folks who are uh, able and willing to uh, uh, connect on, on testimony there. Um, but basically it tracks the bills by number, a little bit of summary on the bill, and then actions in this uh, far right column essentially. And then usually I think under the current status, we're also listing like when the hearings are as well. Um, and I'm sorry, just going back one more thing on the, um, on the my MGA, you can also set up um, bills that you're interested in that will allow you to track those bills specifically uh, and activity on those bills. So uh, there are some great little tutorials on how to do that. Um, and I think that that's you know, something that, that's beneficial as well to, uh, to track that. So that's you know, kind of what we do um, you know, just from the, from the AIA Maryland. Uh, process. So what I'd like to do maybe is to jump uh, over to look at some of the specific bills. <clears throat> and um, what I've tried to do, uh, and this is just kind of very general big buckets. I, I've identified four big buckets of, of bills that we're taking a look at. Um, uh, first <clears throat> is essentially climate change. And you know, this is broad categories, building energy performance, building codes, <clears throat> products, um, and sometimes um, preservation as well. Um, 
and um, we can just kind of go through some of these bills. And if if there and, and Ben, I'll ask you if you can just kind of watch the the chat box if there are questions. Or again, feel free just to to speak up if if you have have questions. Unmute yourself and speak up. So. Some of the bills I think that we're taking a look at, for instance, you know, this House Bill 18, the paint stewardship, um, and, and this is basically a, a trend that I think that we'll see more of. We are expecting a green concrete bill uh, as well this session. Um, and, and essentially, I think, you know, as as architects who are specifying materials, identifying means that we're, you know, uh, working with uh, materials that uh, that either are, are handled uh, cradle to grave um, and and that are uh, not detrimental to the environment. Uh, this is one of those things that I think that we will see, you know, ongoing legislation in that. Uh, I think we're submitting written testimony on that one. Um, House Bill 43, this was the, um, it's called the Sustainable Buildings Act of 22, but this essentially is a bird safe bill. Um, and it's uh, really following lead pilot credit 55 um, and um, basically uh, kind of identifying for state funded um, projects, a, a requirement for um, uh, following lead pilot credit 55 uh, for building design or major renovation. This actually had a hearing yesterday. I think this has gone through um, third or fourth session. And I think in Howard County last year, there was uh, uh, legislation that passed in Howard County. So that was the first county in Maryland to adopt bird safe, uh, you know, building legislation. Um, um, and, you know, for some reason last year it passed through the house, but did it was assigned to a committee and did not get heard in the Senate. Um, um, House Bill 61, I think, is an important bill just in terms of um, energy performance um, enforcement. Um, and essentially uh, what this bill is doing is uh, it's enabling what are the, the larger counties of Maryland to enforce energy performance standards. I think this is um, Delegate Stewart, I believe is uh, Montgomery County Delegate. Is that right, Joe? Yes. Um, and, and Montgomery County, I think, has been pushing for an option to do this. We've seen enforcement um, now, I think, Ben in, in D.C., is that uh, correct? So I think this is, you know, uh, just enabling counties, you know, who, who you know, as, as Maryland energy codes are established or performance standards are established, you know, the state establishes those and then the jurisdictions are required to comply, but they can enhance those requirements uh, through their local legislation. So essentially this is uh, kind of putting some more teeth to that. Yep. So far, I know that the two Washingtons, DC and state both have a, both have a program. This one just gives them the ability to do the fine. It's not actually, right. uh, uh, it doesn't set up a standard or, or regulation. There's a bill that's supposed to be filed this week that actually goes okay. a lot further. I'm, I'm okay. looking forward to getting to read that. Great. Um, then Sustainable Maryland Program Fund. This basically is establishing, um, you know, a $75,000 fund plus means of uh, introducing additional funds into that. But basically it's, uh, it, it's um, um, funding um, uh, that enables kind of sustainability awareness and, and collaboration there. Um, public utilities, uh, energy conservation programs. And this essentially I think has <coughs> identified um, energy savings through retrofits. Um, and uh, I think on this bill, for instance, they've identified a task force and um, often, you know, unfortunately, architects are not included in some of these things, even though we're very Im important in, in terms of developing such things, and we often need to ask to be added to some of these, um, you know, um, programs. So this is um, something that we think would be valuable to have an architect on that, um, uh, on that task force. Um, and then House Bill 171 uh, is um, basically a carbon reduction um, uh, focus. So it's setting uh, goals, um, you know, of 60% re reduction by 2030, 100% by 2040, and then net negative. Um, and um, and essentially, they you know have this climate crisis council that they're establishing, and we're uh, hoping to add an architect to that uh, council as well. 
um, but this is one of um, you know one one of the bills, and I'm not sure if this is parallel to last year. There's a, a climate crisis um, bill that was introduced and um, and passed through the the Senate, uh, Senator Pinsky, and you know carried that through his his committee and through the Senate and got that uh, confirmed. But then it completely stalled in the House. Um, I believe that that bill it it was not pre-filed, but that. Uh, we're expecting to see, I think, uh, to, to arrive tomorrow sometime. And what we hear is that um, that they will have what's called an omnibus bill, or kind of a very all-inclusive um, bill. And that I think last year included, you know, everything from tree planting, um, electric bus uh, systems, um, uh, climate uh, or carbon reduction goals, and a number of uh, other aspects there. Um, and I think what we've heard is that that will go through as an omnibus bill in the Senate, and and we haven't heard yet as to how this will be split up in the House. But we think that it may be as many as four separate bills in the House, which may make it challenging. But maybe we'll get pieces. But hopefully, we'll get more of more of that passed uh, this year. Uh, One of the Chris, yes, Lisa asked a really good question. So if the filing deadline was yesterday, do, do we hear that correctly? Does that mean all bills that are going to be filed are now in and we should see them momentarily? No, what that means, I think, is that if they if they didn't hit that filing deadline, I think they have to go to the rules committee. Is that right, Joe? Be That's correct. Yeah, yes. they'll have a, a mini hearing there as to why they were late and whether they should proceed. Right. Um, so so on that climate crisis bill you know we have what what we felt happened last year and, and we were you know delighted we had been working with senator pinsky on the on the senate side provided testimony and input uh, to the bill and actually last year i think was the first time that in, in my recollection that we've been called by the bill drafter to ask for input on you know the text of the legislation um, and uh, and that you know that was a great opportunity for us to influence that. What we felt happened on the House side is that there was a lot of misinformation um, that uh, precluded things from moving forward, um, and that um, and and the bill stalled in the House. So we made a, a concerted effort to work with. Um, um, Delegate Barve, who chairs the committee, that that would go through, um, and Delegate Stein, who's a primary sponsor last year. So we worked with them over the over the summer, uh, you know, providing our thoughts, also encouraging uh, benchmark legislation, which um, I think had not been uh, introduced yet. I'm not sure if that will be uh, as introduced as a part of the session, but we we certainly <laughs> hope that that that's something will be included because we we don't really know how we're performing if we're not measuring uh, what we're doing now. Um, so, uh, so anyway, that, you know, that's one big piece that I think will, you know, I think has been, you know, the uh, climate change, I think the redistricting, and uh, I can't remember this one other big issue that are hitting the, uh, the legislature this session. Um, but I think our primary focus will probably be the climate change bill. Um, so what so we've heard, I'm sorry. We go got ahead. a great question um, on, I got to scroll back up, uh, the 30% of Maryland land confirmation by 2030. Um, uh, we've been having a conversation on the side about that. There's no bill number yet, but apparently it's being pushed for. Mm -hmm. um, maybe something to be tracking as well. Yes. Um, when, when there's a, a bill filed. Um, yeah, and I, um, um it's right so that's that's one i think certainly you know every week uh, uh joe gives us an update uh, of bills being filed and, and i think you know i i would en encourage you know if those are certainly specific interests of you know uh, of folks um we would encourage dialogue <laughs> and you know connection on that uh, and if there are if there are other organizations that we can or should connect with on some of this legislation that that's great we you know can make make the introductions and figure out how we can work together on um uh, on those important pieces of, of legislation yep and part of that question um this person from morgan state right. is how universities and practices can work together um I, I'm going to do a shameless plug for for the committee, Chris Heads. If you if you want to join us, there is always room. 
Uh, from that committee, we end up doing, you know, it's more an organization of what bills we're going to testify for or what specific language. We all come from our little area of expertise, um, and it's a pretty wide ranging committee on that expertise. So we're always looking for um, more people if they're interested, particularly if they're coming from outside, directly outside the architecture engineering realm where we could use more expertise. Right. And, and I think I, I know that University of Maryland College Park has a student uh, uh, group that I think has focused on carbon uh, reduction as well. I can't remember. Um, and I can I can try to find out um, who is the, the head of that, but I know that I've heard there's a, a woman that I think has, you know, communicated on at least a couple of um, meetings that, that I've been on the f on their focus, which I think is part of this Futures Act. Uh, that's the um, uh, zero carbon uh, campuses by 2025. And I know that um, that's something I think that's been, you know, a, a strong interest uh, of, of the group there in College Park. Um, so, so I think additionally, I think as we understand that there will be 100% zero energy new school uh, bill, um, the the Futures Act I think as I had mentioned, Green Construction Act I think which um, and correct me if I'm wrong Ben, but I think it disallows K through 12 you know uh, schools to have matching funds on renovation if they are using non-electric infrastructure for. Um, uh, for the renovations. Correct. Basically anything carbon generating, right. um, mm -hmm. anything you're going to burn. Uh, and that includes retrofit. It's, it's going to be an interesting discussion in session, I'm sure. Right. Um, um, the uh, green concrete bill, um, uh, this I think was introduced in the past. And I think, Carl, I believe that you're on the on the queue here, I know that this is something that national, uh, I think as AI national has been focused on. Um, and I know that there was strong interest last year. I don't think that it passed, but I think the state was looking at using green concrete and road construction. Um, but I think looking at a more broader application of that now. <laughs> um, and then uh, additionally, we've been working with my delegate, um, uh, for uh, Kathy Forbes on uh, and uh, Senator uh, Hedelman on the high performance building bill. Uh, this I think we've introduced uh, a couple of times and have made some <laughs> edits uh, over time, but basically trying to update the Maryland Green Building Council guidelines there. Um, and, and this is something, this is tied to, was it 2008? We we helped to, to pass that. I think it was a four-year push to get the high performance building bill passed. And that was basically asking the state to lead by example. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the, in that bill initially, the state had increased uh, funding for, um, for high performance schools um, as that was being introduced to try to get the industry up to standard. Um, and that basically uh, the, the additional funding had a sunset period um, and, and now that essentially has become practice and uh, standard practice in, in Maryland, I think for the last 10 years, I believe has been on the top 10 um, you know, lead certified uh, projects on USGBC's list there. So I think that was really important in terms of getting uh, uh, Maryland on, on the list there. Um, then next, I think on big, uh, and again, these are kind of loose, uh, loose categories and things are shuffled a little bit, but uh, next, I think infrastructure, looking kind of at energy, transportation and resilience. Um, and, and, and Ben is probably far more versed, better versed than I am on, you know, energy issues. But I think that we're going to see a lot of energy issues over the, the next few years um, um, to try to figure out what Maryland can do to move uh, away from carbon based fuels and towards um, all electric fuels. And, and I think that that will be a whole range of, you know, uh, identifying means to, to try to uh, enable that to happen through infrastructure, um, enabling, you know, kind of regional sourcing of, uh, of energy. Um, so I think that this is, you know, this is one, one bill that's, that's part of a part of a kind of a large flow of other bills that we will expect to see in the next few years. Um, 
well, let's see, House Bill 58, income tax credit for uh, passive house or energy efficiency upgrades. This is something that we had worked with Delegate Brooks last year. Um, it's not going to uh, make a huge difference in someone um, creating passive house uh, upgrades to uh, to their uh, residents, but, but it's something that we feel is important is identifying opportunities where the state can uh, can incentivize uh, you know, these um, uh, actions to happen. Um, and Delegate Brooks uh, was kind enough to change the language of their legislation this year based upon our dialogue with them last year. So I think uh, it has uh, hopefully a much stronger chance of passing there. Um, House Bill 76 is community solar energy generating systems. This, I think, is part of that infrastructure um, uh, program as well. Um, and essentially, it's, I think, allowing an exemption for these community solar programs if half of the energy produced goes to lower moderate income customers. Um, oops. Um, then Senate Bill 126. Um, and this essentially, it's it's tied to, to motor vehicles, but what I think uh, that one of the reasons I think why we're tracking this is that uh, it identifies basically a pollution fee. Uh, so looking at um, you know, vehicles that would um, exceed the, the standards and establishing a fee that they would have to pay for, for doing that. So I, I think it's really just kind of uh, taking a look at the state's um, uh, the, the legislators taste for imposing fees for non-compliance, uh, which I think will probably relate directly to the building industry as well. Um, then uh, kind of the next big category that uh, we're looking at is professional practice. There are you know kind of two bills so far that we're aware of. We've, we've seen a lot of bills over um, equity and minority participation in the last few years. There are some, uh, but I think that there are more minor bills that we've seen so far this session. Um, one of the bills I think that we've supported this session is, has been pushed by the engineers for a number of uh, years past, and this is um, uh, indemnity and defense liability agreements. And um, what we've, we've been able to work with Department of General Services where most of um, our contra you know, architectural contracts come through, but what the engineers I think have found is that they get a lot of Maryland Department of Transportation contracts that um, basically are requiring them uh, if there if there's an a, an action or or a, a an issue that they have to defend the state and pay for uh, legal uh, legal fees uh, to uh, to defend the state, even though they haven't necessarily been found uh, liable for the issue. So essentially what we're asking for, and, and the, the, the real problem with this is, I guess there are two, two issues. One is our insurance companies will not cover this. Um, so, um, so that's a financial risk and burden uh, that you know, signing a contract you know uh, brings upon any you know any business, um, and then secondly, I think that what we're finding is um, there are a lot of architecture firms that are a sub to an engineer on some contracts. So uh, those uh, you know typically those agreements uh, carry through to the the subs as well. So um, and it's it's you know uh, it's a, a big burden on you know small and uh, minority uh, businesses is that, uh, that essentially, you know, if they want that work, uh, uh, unfortunately, you know, often have to sign some of those contracts. Great. Um, this is a great example for a, did you know, professional right. liability insurance <laughs> right. doesn't cover you for a lawsuit until right. after fault is determined. They won't right. pay for your legal costs up front like general liability does. So right. it's, it's kind of a big deal if you're a, say a 50 person firm like ours uh, mm -hmm. to, yeah. to take on that, that possibility of millions and million of millions of dollars of, of, uh, of legal fees ahead. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Um, so we, we have worked with, um, you know, there's, um, uh, uh, an attorney, Jonathan Shoemaker, I think that you know was was helping on testimony on this. I believe that yeah, that hearing is is today. So we provided written testimony on that, um, and and we actually had a meeting with the attorney general over the summer. Uh, essentially, the the issue with that I think has been that there was a letter that was written by one of the staff on the attorney general that I think has kind of dismissed this. Um, but where I think it's impacted us is it. 
is more that uh, we find local jurisdictions, uh, uh, you know, see that in state contracts, particularly the Department of Transportation, they say, well, I can do that too. Um, so uh, as architects, we find like community colleges or other, um, you know, other jurisdictions will ask us to, to sign those um, uh, similar agreements. Um, and then essentially State Board of Architects, this is um, I think every 10 year, uh, every 10 years that it's uh, just an, an agreement that um, that this is um, processed through through the state and it's typically kind of a, a stamp uh, that just allows that to be extended another 10 years to manage that through the through the state of Maryland there. Um, Next um, big broad category is community and equity. Uh, so I think often this might uh, hit issues of like affordable housing, education, and smart planning. Um, you know, virtually every year there are historic tax credit um, bills that, that come through. Um, you know, one of the things that we have been trying to do also is to communicate that in addition to, you know, being a, a smart use of, of funds, um, it also is, is, you know, being a smart uh, carbon <laughs> efficient, um, uh, you know, uh, project as well when we're working with existing buildings. But one of the things that we've seen over the years is that Maryland's funding for historic tax credits has gone down. Um, you know, currently Maryland invests about a third of what West Virginia invests in historic tax credits and about a tenth of what Virginia invests in historic tax credits. So that's one of the things that I think that we're trying to work with legislators and communicate that, you know, uh, a lot of other states are contributing more money to that. And I think that there generally is very significant economic benefit for communities when, um, you know, uh, historic structures are, are rehabilitated. Um, then House Bill 39, uh, conversion of, um, uh, of state property to affordable housing. You know, this, uh, again, I think is one of those things when, you know, we're taking a look at working with efficiency of, of resources rather than letting buildings uh, be, be torn down or, or stay vacant for many years. This is trying to identify a means of enabling the surplus property to be, you know, turned over to affordable housing. Um, the um, and House Bill 68 is, is a bill we're trying to, to learn a little bit more about. Um, it's um, basically uh, requiring the IAC uh, that uh, yeah, monitors public school construction to consider you know, these systemic renovation projects regardless of cost. Um, so Joe, I think, is working on trying to connect with Delegate Watson or I Senator spoke, Hester. I spoke with her chief of staff yesterday and uh, okay. trying to get in time with her. And we also have a meeting mm -hmm. with Delegate Queen uh, this right. week. Right, yeah. right, yes. Um, and then uh, additionally, there's uh, the Complete Streets uh, Bill that basically is taking um, fines from the um, uh, traffic violations in Baltimore City and investing that in, um, in uh, street infrastructure for Baltimore City. This is something that um, I know uh, has been introduced. I think this is the third uh, time this bill has been introduced. and. Uh, we have supported it each time. I know Baltimore chapter has also uh, ardently supported that and we're hoping to, to see that go through. Um, and then also House Bill 202 is another historic tax credit bill, I think is changing the uh, threshold amount uh, to reduce that from 5,000 to $2,500. Um, and I think those are, um, uh, what I believe are, are kind of the, the key issues that we are focusing on, on the bills that we've seen thus far. Um, and, you know, uh, you know, as, as we get bills in, we try to read them uh, quickly um, and identify folks that can communicate, you know, either communicate directly with the legislator to understand issues about these bills, uh, to write letters or to offer to testify on the bills and trying to figure out how, you know, how we can, um, uh, you know, most effectively, you know, work with uh, legislators on, you know, on those bills. Um, so, uh, you know, so again, essentially, we're, we're meeting every Monday, 
you know, at noon, Sandy, I think, can share the link if anyone is interested. Or if you take a look and, and don't have time or don't want to participate in that, but if you scroll through that every every now and then and take a look and find a bill that you're interested in, we would certainly welcome uh, input and communication and try to see, you know, if there are ways that, um, that either you can connect with legislators or work with us to try to broaden our network and, and be more effective. Um, you know, and I think that's uh, kind of a, a summary of what we know at this point right now. I don't know if folks had any additional questions. Uh, I got one from way up top uh, <laughs> and maybe it's more of an emphatic point than a, um, mm -hmm. <laughs> that we, we can't, to, to Joe's examples where it took many, many years to pass things, you know, Lisa points right. out, we, we can't spend 20 years waiting to get climate change <laughs> right. legislation yeah. done. Right. Um, maybe this is a good time to talk about how anyone can get involved, sign up, give testimony. Right. Uh, if, if it's something you're passionate about getting involved. Yeah, and, and that's, you know, particularly, I think, like on this climate change bill this year, um, you know, what, what happened this, this past year, there, I can't remember how many um, um, pieces of legislation the governor vetoed, but there was a special session this year that's really focused upon redistricting, but the first thing that happens, happens in special session is that they have to vote on the bills that were vetoed from the prior session. Um, this year being the last year of our governor's uh, um, tenure, um, he if 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 he vetoes a bill, um, and, you know that that extends beyond the session. Um, basically, that bill has to start all over again. So, uh, from what we've heard from Senator Pinsky and Delegate Barve on the climate change bill, particularly as they're going to act fast even though it was not pre-filed, <laughs> um, but they're going to try to get that uh, through through hearings um, and try to get that bill approved and on the governor's desk so that he would uh, be forced to act on that before the end of session. So if it is vetoed, that that can be overridden through the through the house and try to, to move forward with that um, and not have to kick that to the next session and, and have an, an undetermined governor uh, um, for next session to, to work with. Uh, so you're right, Lisa, and we do, <laughs> we do, need, to, we do need to act, act quickly on that. Um, uh, and go and ahead, there's going to be a lot of call for testimony. Um, yeah. Again, I put I put Chris's email in there. I didn't actually ask him ahead of time, yeah, but I put good. Chris's email in there yeah. for for joining us on, on the committee uh, where we're going to be organizing some of that pushing uh, for that bill. Uh, I think it's a great time to open it for questions. We got we got five minutes left before we we've had our hour. I'm gonna put also a link for um, that my my inner inner uh, chamber connections <laughs> here um, had this is a, a great link. Let me see if I can get that posted there. <laughs> if nobody else has questions, I've got yeah. one for Joe. Okay. Um, so Joe, it it's obvious that personal relationships with our uh, delegates and state senators, they, they really matter in getting this, this local, you know, state action completed. They do. How do we go about developing those relationships? Well, um, sometimes people uh, don't realize that they have a connection with someone. I mean, you might have kids that go to the same school. I mean, some, it, it takes some research sometimes, and I'm, but I'm happy to be a resource if anybody says, you know, uh, I'd like to know something about my delegate or senator in my district, uh, we have we have bios and we have points of interest that you know we refer to when we go in to talk to them as well. So um, the I, I think the best thing to do is to first of all get to know your immediate legislators. That that's who will respond to you the most. And um, if if it all lines up, if the if the planets line up that they happen to be on the committee, all the better. But if not it's always good to have somebody on the ground, like a, a delegate or a senator that can communicate to somebody on your behalf. But establishing a, a communication rapport with a legislator is primo, it really is. Right. Yeah. And to use your word from the beginning, particularly on issues, you can speak from a, a place of professional knowledge or your bona fides, I think is what you said. Exactly. Um, 
Exactly. There's a lot of power in standing up before a committee and saying, I'm an engineer, we do this, mm -hmm. and th these are the facts, you've been misled. It's, right. it, it, <laughs> it matters. Right, yeah, and, and that's, you know, it's it's interesting, I think, Ben, to, to that point, there were a number of years ago, um, like four, I think, when there was uh, legislation that was put forth by the Maryland Concrete Association <laughs> trying to uh, eliminate um, or, or put um, basically tie the you know tie the hands of uh, wood frame construction, mm -hmm. um, and they brought uh, firefighters in to testify <laughs> on these bills, um, basically indicating that um, you know wood frame uh, construction is unsafe and that everybody should be building with concrete, um, with you know. Uh, uniform firefighters <laughs> suggesting that. So, you know, one of the things that we, you know, had to testify, for instance, on that bill is to identify that, you know, when when projects are, are built in wood frame and you're building a one hour wall out of wood versus a one hour wall out of concrete, you have essentially the same fire rating. Um, and you're, you know, we're, you know, I identifying this from folks that are responsible for protecting life you know, and safety of, of building occupants. So I think, uh, it, you know, having credibility and speaking from experience and, and trying to make sure that folks are uh, looking at and framing things properly, I think is important. And we were able to able to defeat that uh, legislation, which really would have um, put, you know, really tied the hands, particularly on affordable housing in, in Maryland. So I think it's important to, to be able to, to frame things in a way that legislators can understand and why it's important. And as I recall, that also didn't make a distinction to heavy timber, which of course is Correct. becoming a, a, a fantastic tool for building right. carbon capture for embodied carbon. So it's right. Yeah, that, that would have been an interesting one to have to go back against. Yeah, and, and it was also you know one that unfortunately I think there were two projects that uh, one that caught fire during the unrest in Baltimore, and you know the firefighters' hoses were cut, so they were not able to put it out when the building was nearly complete. And a similar one down in College Park that, from you know whatever uh, mishaps of of water not being turned on, that uh, that that really caused significant damage down there. Yeah, particularly mid-construction before you have those, right. those one-hour fire barriers and whatnot. Right, and, exactly. Yeah. Um, I think that's uh, that's our time. Um, right. Joe and Chris, thank you so much for doing this. I uh, plan to come back after now that I know when Sine Die is to, to set up <laughs> a, an April or, or later April event just to do a recap. Right. What did, what did right. we get done? What are we going to push for next year? Um, and go. again, uh, email Chris or... Uh, email me. I'm on the COAT website with, with Zolna, so you can find us find us there um, if, if you'd like to join us. Thank you, everyone. Right. Thanks, Thanks, all. Appreciate Don't be it. shy. Get involved. Okay. Exactly. <laughs> all right. Take care. Thank you.